Visit Hellsberg.com for safe and easy ways to shop this holiday, like free shipping and returns, virtual shopping appointments, or buy online and pick up in store. And right now, get a free Microsoft Surface Go 2 with the purchase of $1,499 or more. You gift, you get. Limited time offer while supplies last. See online or in store for details. Legacy CRM platforms have made you compromise for far too long. With HubSpot CRM platform, you don't have to choose between enterprise tools that are powerful or easy to use. It gives you both, so your marketing, sales, and service teams can align with ease, accelerate sales, and anticipate every customer need. Finally, there's a CRM platform that helps you run better so you can grow better, without complexity ever getting in the way. Learn more at HubSpot.com. Hello listeners, my name is Casey and I am the host of The Cult Vault, a podcast that looks into some of history's most notorious cults. Join me as I look at cults, cult behaviour and dive deep into the psyche of some of the heinous leaders of these movements. Listen to interviews with survivors and testimonies from those who have been affected by these sects but live to tell their stories. If you enjoy well-researched, no-nonsense accounts you will enjoy this podcast. Join me on all major streaming platforms at The Cult Vault. I hope to hear from you soon. The National Center for Atmospheric Research has predicted that the current sunspot cycle number 25 may well be among the strongest ever observed by humans. It started sometime in 2019 and will peak in the mid-2020s and finish sometime around 2030. They suggest a maximum sunspot number as high as 260. For comparison, the last cycle peaked at a mere 116. But what does all that mean? Well, before we get started, the link to loreandlegends.net in the episode details will have pictures and links to go along with everything mentioned in this episode if you want to follow up. Now first off, we'll start at the main source of all this, the sun. Sol, being the Latin name of the Roman sun god, and solar, meaning of or from the sun. The sun has what we call solar cycles, a period of roughly 11 years that features a solar minimum and a solar maximum. The solar minimum is the time where the smallest number of observed sunspots exists, and the solar maximum is the time where the most sunspots are observed. What we call sunspots appear on the surface of the sun as dark spots that stand out from the normal surface of the sun. The average sunspot is about the same size as planet Earth. They appear as dark spots because they are cooler than the surrounding surface of the sun by a few thousand degrees, and they also represent powerful disturbances in the sun's magnetic field. The magnetic field around these sunspots can be around 2,500 times the strength of the Earth's magnetic field. Studying and hopefully one day fully understanding this cycle matters because these regions of the sun that feature sunspots are usually the origin points for coronal mass ejections and solar flares, which, as you probably know, can have all kinds of effects here on Earth, from the aurora borealis to the techno-apocalypse-inducing electromagnetic pulse. More sunspots means more potential for these things to head Earth's way. Let's look at the difference between a coronal mass ejection, or CME for short, and a solar flare. A coronal mass ejection is just how it sounds, an ejection of mass, actual matter, from the sun. As the powerful magnetic fields around sunspots interact, they can hurl plasma away from the sun. These charged particles are flung into space like a cosmic shotgun blast. The speed at which these particles are ejected can vary from half a million miles an hour to nearly 7 million miles per hour, and thus reach the Earth in a matter of hours up to a few days. A solar flare is radiation energy moving at the speed of light, and that energy can reach Earth in about 8 minutes. If you go back to that idea of the cosmic shotgun, the CME is the plasma BBs or buckshot, and the flare is the muzzle blast. A CME and a flare can have different effects on Earth as well. A solar flare can disturb the atmosphere and temporarily disrupt radio signals that we use to communicate, from boats to planes to cell phones, 
not to mention satellites in orbit. A CME, being physically charged particles, interacts with Earth's magnetic field. This oscillation of the magnetic field creates currents, which head to the poles, which cause the auroras at the north and south poles. A strong enough blast of charged particles can cause enough distortion in the magnetic field that it too can affect radio signals, and even GPS. And at the extreme, the particles from a CME can induce enough magnetic field shenanigans to induce current in our own electrical grids and systems, which could easily lead to disaster. Think electromagnetic pulse apocalypse. The good news is that Earth is small, far away from the sun, and is a moving target. Usually these things miss. Institutions like NASA continuously monitor the sun for these events in an effort to understand the nature of the sun to enable us to better prepare for the long-term future, and to provide warning of immediate or impending doom should the sun point our way with a big one. The bad news is, we aren't all that prepared. Solar flares and CMEs usually happen together at the same time. And the sun has hit us lots of times, and even recently. We still don't really understand the way the sun works. From what we do know, early warning can help in some cases, but can't fully alleviate our inadequacy. We are more dependent on radio and electrical grids than at any other point in human history. And in a minute, we'll discuss how we now possess the ability, through nuclear weapons, to do much of this to ourselves at will. The auroras the sun causes happen all the time. People travel from all over the world to see them. They're beautiful, and are even one of the default backgrounds available in Zoom. Side note, the classic green color you often see with an aurora is due to affected oxygen around 60 miles up in the atmosphere. Red auroras are from oxygen about 200 miles up, and nitrogen is responsible for the blues and the purples. What's less known is incidences of severe direct hits on Earth. This is for a couple reasons. We only really started paying any real meaningful attention at all to any of this in the mid-1700s, and we didn't have any significant use of electronics or radio until the later part of the 1800s. The first major incident we can point to is the infamous Carrington event of 1859. An intense amount of charged particles hit the Earth, shorting out telegraph lines all over the world, which in turn sparked many fires. The aurora produced by this event could be seen as far south as Cuba. We now know the Carrington event, named after one of the scientists who first correlated it with the sun, started with the observation of stronger-than-usual auroras at the poles, a clear sign of a solar flare. Then within days, the CME arrived and wreaked havoc. The resulting near-global aurora was so bright that it was reported that miners in Colorado would wake up hours early, thinking it was daylight, and began making breakfast. Still others thought the light show was perhaps the beginning of the end of the world. Now, we've of course come a long way technologically since 1859, and you probably have more than one electronic device with you at all times, plus our expansive power grid and the countless other electronics that we use on a daily basis, and especially vulnerable communications and GPS satellites in orbit that do not have as much protection or natural shielding from the Earth. If the Carrington event happened today, it's estimated that it could cause trillions of dollars in damages and take nearly 10 years to recover from. Now, think about that for a second, in terms of 2020. A virus that the vast majority of people recover from has kicked the world straight in the groin and led to trillions of dollars lost across the globe. And at least one estimate, published in the American Medical Association Journal, estimates that it might take some $16 trillion worth of expenditure before we recoup. Do you think there would be less panic and the situation would be less severe? if virtually all of our communications and electrical equipment that our economies now depend on, from cars to banks to hospitals, failed over the course of a single day? Another significantly less severe CME hit Canada on March 13, 1989. The preceding aurora was visible as far south as Texas. Power was knocked out in parts of Canada for most of the day, accompanied by communications disruptions and satellite outages. Then, in 2012 of all years, a Carrington event-sized CME only missed the Earth in its orbit by about nine days. The threat from our own sun is very real, and is one we should take seriously. 
and it seems like it should be especially so in an era where virtue signaling concern for public health and safety based on quote-unquote science is all the rage. But I suspect for this example, the quotes probably don't apply, since this isn't something that allows you to control the general daily behavior of free people. But on that note, speaking of power-hungry people, how about the looming threat of the man-made bomb-induced electromagnetic pulse? You may have noticed this before if you've ever been around a spinning motor and experienced radio interference, or maybe you've seen warnings on some equipment about people with pacemakers being nearby. The idea is the same as the CME. Fluctuations in the magnetic field induce current, which can interfere with signals or even damage electronic components. This isn't a conspiracy. The U.S. and the Russian governments have researched, tested, and proven it several times, dating back to the 1950s. The way it works, a nuclear warhead is detonated in the air above a target. The explosion creates enough energy in the area to free electrons from nitrogen and oxygen atoms. These electrons interact with the Earth's magnetic field and induce current in the nearby area below. The bigger the bomb and the closer to the north or south pole it is detonated, the bigger the effect. Starfish Prime is the name of one major test the United States conducted on July 9, 1962 launched from the infamous Johnston Island in the direction of Hawaii. It detonated some 250 miles above the surface. The yield of the bomb was 1.4 megatons, and it produced a red and yellow aurora at the site, and also on the opposite side of Earth. The resulting EMP effect knocked out streetlights and telephones in Hawaii, many satellites in orbit, and even damaged electronics in New Zealand more than a thousand miles away. That same year, the Soviet Union tested its own EMP. At about 300 kilotons, the Soviet Test 184 was smaller yield than Starfish Prime. But it was done over Kazakhstan, and much closer to the North Pole than Hawaii, and much more populated. Though not much was officially recorded or released by the Soviet Union, we know it virtually destroyed a phone line network in a 350-mile radius that was even protected by fuses and that it sparked at least one fire. Nuclear arms have since proliferated around the world, even to poor countries like North Korea and quite possibly Iran, and it might only take one to spark a catastrophe. Now, there are more insidious, but safer, non-nuclear EMP-inducing bombs that are being researched all the time. The main idea behind these is that a smaller non-nuclear explosion could generate very high-frequency microwave radiation that achieves the same effect as the nuke, though much more localized to a specific target, with none of the fallout associated with nuclear material. Whether it's the sun or humanity itself, the threat of the EMP effect is very, very real. So what can and should we do? Well, as an individual, consider having some analog electronics around, a hand crank radio, or a solar panel for charging batteries, and think about Faraday cages and how you might make one. Basically, it's a metal box or shield that directs the current around and away from whatever is inside. The struggle, though, is that it has to be completely sealed in conductive material, but it wouldn't be hard to make a small one for a few small survival gadgets. You might also consider a classic car that isn't ran entirely by computers and maybe have a gas generator around as well. As a society, the main thing is designing new grid systems that can successfully divert excess power in rapid fashion and avoid dangerous overloads and overheating. This will require lots of time, strategic planning, and of course money. But most of the technology needed to replace that existing transformer on your telephone pole already exists. The science of the sun is far from settled, and the National Center for Atmospheric Research is not the only entity testing theories and hypotheses centered around the solar cycle. We really know very little about the sun. It's really only recently that we've begun to understand the solar wind, thanks to men like Eugene Parker in the latter part of the 20th century. And the Parker Solar Probe, launched in 2018, that as of this podcast has orbited the sun about five times, and after its 24th orbit, sometime in the mid-2020s, will attempt to touch the sun. The science of the nuke and the microwave bomb, however, is settled. Its use and our preparation for all of the possible effects, whether from the bomb or the sun, is going to depend more on human psychology. 
If you liked this episode, be sure to click subscribe and share it with someone you know. You can also follow me on Twitter, at LaurenLegends3, on Instagram, at LaurenLegends1, and on Parlor at ObiWade. Also, be sure to check out LaurenLegends.net, and there's also a Lauren Legends YouTube channel you can subscribe to. That's all I had for this episode. See you next time.